Hello, I'm Jonathan Weiner. I'm Enrique Gonzalez Mueller. And welcome to season four, episode two of Are You Listening? We will be covering home studio mixing, how we deal with different monitoring options, how we set up a room. Speakers versus headphones, software, and even room tuning software yeah. to think about incorporating that into your mixing practice. So please join us for this episode, and don't forget to subscribe to the Isotope YouTube channel to make sure that you get notified about future episodes coming from Isotope and future episodes of Are You Listening? We may talk about best practices, the best way to listen. I want everybody to feel encouraged. The picture on the cover of a magazine or on a website, people still see magazines occasionally, I think. I heard. With these beautiful, large consoles, big speakers, lots of sound treatments, yeah. and they're expensive. People don't spend that money just because they like spending money or just because they look cool. There's actually a functional aspect to them. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that's the only place that you can do the work. I had a little basement room in my house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which was a terrible, terrible little room. And I had a pair of Yamaha S10s, which are, were famous for being You were luxury speakers. already. Uh, right? You were right? luxury. Uh -huh. And frankly, at the time, that made total sense for me. Because where I was in terms of my journey and, and my practice, I could do the things that I needed to do to start to get better. You start with the gear that makes sense for you, either because it's the gear that makes sense for you financially yeah. or because it, it allows you to hear enough so you can start working. And at some point, you bump up against the limitations of what you're working with, and you're like, okay, how can I make my situation a little better? What could I do? Could I get a better pair of headphones? Could I get a better pair of speakers? Could I think about the room? And gradually you figure out what matters yeah. in what way and you start to make things better. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if you can remember the first place you ever made a recording or the first place you ever made a mix. The first recording thing I had was a little Tascam cassette thing that was a four track and it had a little speaker. Oh, you had four tracks? Oh, I did. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Mega luxury here. But my monitoring was the little speaker. Nice. On top of the thing. Nice. And I made things that emotionally moved me. And my cousin at the time, who we were the, the two of us where that's what we had at our disposal. As I'm hearing you talk, you said budget, you know? Yes, we bumped, that's what we could afford. The thing that's interesting to me is that if you couldn't plant our brains into those kids back then, with the limited resources they'd have, they would be able to do so much more. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, is it the guitar that lets you play all that cool stuff? If you grab an amazing guitar player and give them a really modest guitar, they still can make it sing and mm -hmm. make something that it's emotionally moving to others. If you grab a guitar player who's only been playing for a couple of weeks and you give them the best guitar, it doesn't quite work that way. So as you're talking to me, these are kind of edges to explore. Sure. You have told a story about the first time you ever had to make a record at home. Oh, yeah. In your home studio. Oh, yeah. Um, which I think is a helpful, helpful At my story. home, period. There was no studio. So. <laughs> well, but everybody's home is a studio, right? My home studio is the <laughs> franchise, and there are billions of them all across the planet, right? Yes. Yeah. But I think it's it's a helpful way to sort of frame out some of this. So. I had graduated from college and I had spent maybe three years working at a professional studio in, um, in the Bay Area, in California, a great studio called The Plant. This was the continuation from my Berkeley education, right at Berkeley, I had great gear. Here they had, wow, a Telefunken 251, $25,000 microphone and monitoring to match. So in my mind, I always equated that the only way to make something professional was you needed to have that gear. So then I get a phone call from a dear friend of mine who was managing a band called Vinilo Versus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from my hometown. And I know those guys and I love them. They're my friends. Our mixing engineer just bailed on us. Could you master? Could you master? Could you mix this record? Sure. When do you need it? It needs to be done in 10 days. All right. 
what's your budget? And the budget was impossibly small. Mm -hmm. I knew what a day of studio time cost yeah. at the plant. Yeah. And their entire budget could buy them one day. I'm not going to be able to mix this thing in a day. And I go listen to the multi-track and it's kind of modestly recorded. Mm -hmm. So the only place that I could do it was at my house. And I said, it's not at my home studio because literally it just had boom box speakers so that I could just listen while I cooked. I never listened to anything critically there. So I had to make do mm -hmm. and I started to play great references at home. Mm -hmm. And just seeing how the playback system sounded, how the room may affected it, and how did I feel here? The thing that was the hardest was my perception. Mm -hmm. Because I was so fearful of this will never be professional. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I just had to take Enrique, psh, go jump in. You just had to do it. And do your you best. You just had to do it. But I had what I was saying about if we could only bring the brain of a pro, of an experienced pro to somebody that's younger, I knew what good sounded like. Yeah. So, okay. Once you have the experience of creating and working in a place where you get the sense of what good sound is or your system yeah. supports it, mm -hmm. you learn a lot that then becomes portable. Then you can take it home and say, I remember that if I cut 300 dB yeah. below 100 hertz out of my bass, I'm probably going to lose all my low end. So even though my home studio is suggesting that, I'm maybe going to, you know, I'm going to look at the spectrum in my equalizer and sort of remember what I did in those environments where I could hear things yeah. and focus on the way something feels as opposed to sort of trying to get too clever. What's sort of like the baseline for you uh -huh. in order to get the feel, the inspiration? You know, are there any l sort of limitations? For me, I need to be in, a, in an environment where I can understand the low end, the mm. extension of the low end. I can also have the mid range not be harsh. It needs to be true. It also can't be as I sometimes feel concave. It can't, it needs to hurt me enough. And the top end, it needs to be open. So yeah, I can't compromise on monitoring because I am building something from the ground up. Having said this, mm -hmm. once I, cool, ah, here's my kick drum and my bass and my vocals and my cymbals, I then completely embrace the, I'm gonna go make some coffee and just tune out for a moment and grab my phone and play that mix on my phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that really inf helps me inform decisions on leveling, on even stereo spread of stuff, even on a little mono speaker because of how it collapses things, et cetera, et cetera. So the minimum are great headphones, you know, okay. just having a great, great pair of headphones that will react to 35 Hertz. The quality of what you're hearing is really important when you are making a critical decisions, being able to then assess the outcome. You can look at, you can listen through to mix metaphors, a bunch of different lenses, right? Yeah. Whether you're paying attention or not paying attention mm -hmm. through a band limited speaker. But if you're not hearing all of that, you want to be careful about making decisions. Like you might listen on your phone speaker and say, I'm not hearing any bass at all. Is that okay? Yeah. And then go back into your good environment. Great. And listen and think, is there something I could change? to make it sound like there's some bass coming from a speaker that cuts off at 250 or not? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm thinking of you, the mastering engineer, when I'm mixing. But when I'm mixing, I am thinking of all the stages that happen, right? A mix engineer gets something to mix, they pull something up, and they listen to the shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Well, how about if the recording engineer would have been thinking about the mixing stage and recorded with informed by the mix? Well, how about if the producer then is informing the recording. Yes. Yeah. So for me, yeah. I need to be in an environment where when I produce, I need to be able to put the kick drum, which is arguably, let's say, the first thing that I'm doing, I need to put it where it needs to be so that when I go and track the bass, I can make it lock. Yeah. Because if not, I'm just letting issues go by the wayside that I then need to fix on the next stage and they just multiply. Right. There are consequences to decisions that we make. If we have a room, for instance, that has, you know, a huge deficit of energy at 40 hertz. And so we just crank an 808 kick. 
20 dB hotter than it, it actually is oh, yeah. in a mix because that's the only way that we're going to hear it in that listening position. <laughs> and then you take it out and you wonder why, at the very least, your mix sounds so quiet mm -hmm. because all the whole meter is taken up with the, the 808. So you picked up a pair of headphones. Do you ever work in headphones? All the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to know from you what headphones give you and what you and why don't you always work in headphones? And in some ways, headphones are a lot cheaper than making a room. I typically start on speakers. And it's for a technical reason and for an emotional reason. Mm -hmm. I'm able to crank them loud and I just get excited about doing that. Mm -hmm. So I also very quickly get my balancing together, get my panning together. And once instinctually I'm there, I play that rough mix on speakers and I get out of the sweet spot and I go to another room, mm -hmm. I go to the back and I just see how the blob mm -hmm. of sound is feeling which is I can't do on headphones. That's, I've never thought about it quite that way. That's really actually brilliant. You can't get out of the sweet spot when you've got headphones on. So that's the, the technical and the emotional reasons why I start with speakers. The thing that I find then is that my objectivity and, and fatigue starts setting and my objectivity starts to go, I start to get tired and I leave the room. When I come back, the first thing that I do is listen again on speakers out of the sweet spot, make those big moves. The kick drum is way too quiet or way too loud. Make those moves. And then I listen on headphones to diversify. And I just take a swing. And when I put on headphones, immediately I glean things that I did not catch on speakers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a hiss that I didn't quite get that that was there. Oh, actually, the pinpoint panning of this, I hear more accurately on headphones. Well, wait, let me check. And I have this moment of double checking, and then I take a good four hours on headphones. Then I put them away, and I'm always trying to diversify. But I have to confess that my finishing polishing I do on headphones. Uh -huh. And it's those five... 0.5 dB automation move, the panning that I want exactly to end here, et cetera, et cetera. Double check my low end on speakers again, and then I'm done. So here's the hard question. If you had the world's greatest listening environment in speakers and the world's greatest headphones, would you still finish in headphones? I make decisions on speakers where I need access to the low end and, and a certain amount of things that headphones have a hard time reproducing for me. But at the end of the day, I'm really going to bat for the average person's experience hmm. to tell you the truth. Hmm. And for me, my headphones, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit diverging a little away from your, from your question, but I don't have the world's greatest speakers. Right. And I don't have the world's greatest headphones, one, because I can't afford them, right. two, because I don't want them either. Right. So I have a level of fidelity that is going to get me to, to pro level. And to me, I end with the common human is going to listen to something. This is a, a, a good representation of a great top tier of the common human. I need to make it rock here. Mm -hmm. it, it is really a different listening experience. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's awesome about like $250 headphones is that you can hear everything. And that's in a way it's problematic mm -hmm. because if you're trying to judge from the listener's point of view, the protagonist, yeah. like you can really have the vocals like 10 dB too quiet. Mm -hmm. Where on a, in headphones you can you can actually reach for them and find them with your attention, yeah, and they'll disappear in speakers. Yeah, so I think having that filter uh, that is maybe slightly less accurate or presents imaging and spectrum mm -hmm. in the way that speakers in a room does is really really important. Do you listen in mono when you mix? I'm thinking a little bit of this experience. Yeah. Personally, I don't have a collapse my whole mix to mono button so that I can check, but. When I have the really wide synthesizer, I always collapse it to mono before I, so, okay, I'm gonna widen this. Whoa, it's amazing, cool. Before you go, collapse it to mono. Oh, it goes down five dB. And then I might change the, the phase relationship between the two 
to make that a little bit better, and then I go back. I'm a metalhead at heart. When I work on productions that are heavy, you know, they can be EDM or, or anything that is meant to just go, Arr. there's typically one item that is panned hard left and right that's supposed to make a wall of sound. For years, my mixes always came back that those guitars, those synthesizers were always too quiet. Yeah. And my vocals were too loud. Why? It's because I was always sitting in the sweet spot mm. and the energy coming at me from these two things, then when you collapse them, they feel different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why I always get out of the sweet spot mm -hmm. and come back. Let's sort of dive into more of the technology that supports our listening experience. Yeah. So we talked about headphones and I, I would just personally say a good D to A converter something that drives the headphones is important, but also whether the playback circuit is underpowered, like listening through a laptop line output yeah. can be problematic with some headphones. If somebody said, how low do your speakers need to go for them to work for you to be good enough? Do you have a number? I know for mastering, we're, we're like looking for 20 Hertz. I think you're not looking for 20 Hertz. No, but I am looking for 30. You are. We'll see it later when we start EQing kick drums, right? You bump up a lot of 50 hertz. Well, if your Q is this wide, All right. you want to know what's, what's up at 30. Sometimes you have vocals that have these pops that get insanely low. A lot of people will think, well, why would I need to hear 30 hertz? Because most people won't hear 30 hertz or because there's not a lot of musical information down there. Uh -huh. What you're calling out, you want to hear everything that's there. Right, to make sure that that low frequency pop isn't the thing that's screwing up your compressor. There's also the angle, the equilateral triangle. If you can't accurately hear the image, sides versus center, mm -hmm. it's really hard to know where to place the vocal. I would work at professional studios and I would just take for granted that whatever they had set up was the thing. Then I go home and things sound like this or I have this happening, right? So what do I go? I start with science. I need to sit in the median plane. It needs to be an equidistant triangle. If I want to hear an accurate representation of the phantom image, and I want that hallucination to be accurate, I really need to be in the center. So I go home and I measure. Great, this in theory should work. You hit play, to a reference mix, to what I'm considering a reference mix, right? A calibration tool that has information, low, high, wide, center. And I see how it comes back. The thing that I found sometimes, uh, a lot of the times, is that things weren't as I expected. And I had a lot of trouble with the top end at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the stuff going, what? But everything is measured right. And then, ding! this dawned on me a lot of people talk about this but not a lot of people talk about this oh height compared to the tweeter yes yeah and this to me is something that when i teach at berkeley this is one of the first things i put in there yes equidistant triangle but go and listen and listen and listen and listen and then do this one experiment and i don't even tell them what they should be listening to or what to expect and i tell them listen go a foot higher Go a foot lower. How does your uh, experience change? And the top end changes drastically. You know, the higher the frequency, the more directional it is, right? So if you have this laser beam of high frequency right at your ear, the tweeter is right at your ear. Great. You move it that much. It's like you grabbed an entire shelving EQ and changed it. Yeah. Should the tweeter always be at the ear level, though? I found that in, in my home, it was a little bit too harsh and bright. Mm -hmm. So actually, I EQ'd it by moving the speakers a little bit at home because that's all I could do. You raise a really interesting question. Oh, my gosh, do I have to have my head locked in a vice in the sweet spot all the time? Uh -huh. And the answer is no. You know, if you do this with your body, you've changed the phase relationship at 20K between the two speakers by 180 degrees. Yeah. Fortunately, we're not listening to 20 kilohertz records. It's not important that you have this singular position where you can't move your body, mm -hmm. but you do have this sort of general sweet spot. Yeah. And, and focusing your tweeters in the way that you're positioning 
your monitors is really important. Yeah. I was smiling earlier because I often walk into the mastering room at school and kids take their their chair and I don't know if this and they right. go like this and the yeah. tweeters up here. Yeah. yeah. And I come in, I'm like, do you notice anything different about the top end? Yeah. Anyway. If recording engineers would also think about this stuff, I'd tell students, if you grab a microphone and you're recording a vocal and you have it like this to your mouth versus like this to your mouth, what's the difference? Right. And the clarity of the top end is going to yeah. change a little bit. So, Good point. Yeah. So if you had a big null at 40 hertz and you were EQing the heck out of 40 hertz and wondering if you had too much, you could pull up something like tonal balance control yeah. and look at a reference and, and look and say, gee, it looks like I got a big spike that's outside of what's typically the case. Yeah. Let me go back and listen and think about where have I placed that 808 or where have I EQ'd that, that kick or that bass. Yeah. If you look at the imager, there's a tool that helps you understand the relationship between center and sides, mm -hmm. either by looking at an XY Lissajou or you know, a polar, the polar display that shows you what's correlated, what's not correlated. Yeah. Another kind of technology that's out in the world that's worth discussing at least for a moment is room correction software. And for those that aren't familiar with it, um, it is software that will build basically a map of the performance of sound in your room over time. It's like a, a time domain analyzer. Mm -hmm. And it will build a filter to undo the timing problems in the room. You know, the reason that you have a 40 hertz deficit or huge bump in one spot of the room is because of the, how the sound is bouncing around over time in the room. It doesn't replace all of the other thoughtful things that we need to do about placing speakers and about putting ourselves in the room in the right spot and using headphones and listening level and all of that. Yeah. We're not trying to make the speakers sound better. We're trying to hear the signal better. I was thinking of people that maybe are on tour and they have to go and cut a vocal in a place where they've never been to. So just taking two steps back to celebrate tonal balance control, mm -hmm. to have that double check, mm -hmm. to have that extra layer of look at it, mm, I can, has gotten me so much further mm -hmm. with the efficiency and effectiveness of, of creating great mixes from the ground up. I think the point that I would want to make is I'm looking for something that helps me compensate for or at least understand the characteristics of the environment that I'm in. There are tools that offer crossfeed, like that will simulate speakers in headphones. There are other tools that are designed to like put you in a room. I think those are interesting yeah. and, and there might be insights that you can get from them. I think we have to be a little bit careful because that's no longer giving us just plain insight. Yeah. You know, or helping to clarify the signal, but yeah. it's, it's like adding this kind of veneer. It's like rose-colored glasses, right? Yeah. Where you're always filtering what you're hearing in a certain way. Mm -hmm. When it comes time to critical listening and making critical decisions, uh, it can be counterproductive. It could be a fun, quick check to add diversity and enrich your perspective. But yeah, I label it like you do. Even if you have the perfect room, other people matter. <laughs> other people's opinions matter. Oh, yeah. Right? It's sometimes we lose perspective, so other people are even more helpful and more important. So talk to me a little bit about how you get that additional perspective and input. The psychology of mixing to me is a big topic. What are the difficulties going in? I'm a procrastinator. And I also am afraid of starting to mix. I'm fearful. Mm -hmm. I want to do a good job. So to get myself psyched, I listen to great music and that feeds into the psychology of how am I boarding something? And then I go, oh, I want to make, I want to put stuff in the world that is this cool. And then I jump in. At some point, my energy starts to wane. My objectivity starts to go. So what do I use to deploy to help me bring me back up? Mm -hmm. I punch in reference mixes to tell me, mm -hmm. oh, those are where the highs should be. These are okay. But then there's a psychological aspect to having another human listen to your work. And this I split in two different tiers. One is I could play it for somebody who understands what is the genre vocabulary, someone that is going to be honest with me, mm -hmm. somebody that can say things that are, that are useful and is not thinking to make me happy. This is hard. Yeah. So this could be either a pro yes, that a pro is going to switch on and say, I love you. 
but your kick drum this, your, and they can go right into there. Or a friend of yours that just seems to have those very special characteristics. I would shy away though from playing it for anybody who is gonna, who loves you to death. And my mom always loves all of them. Actually, no, my mom is a harsh critic. <laughs> <laughs> But I wouldn't play it for friends that are just yes people. I wouldn't play it, you know, here is my dubstep track and I'm playing it for somebody who doesn't know a thing about this genre. So mm -hmm. that's one. I'm kind of ashamed of admitting this, but I would when I'm working in bigger studios and I have an assistant. Yeah. Because I'm so self-sufficient, I typically ask them, you can go take a break. Mm -hmm. If they're really eager to learn, I just have them be a fly on the wall. But when I start to get to these stages, I go, hey, Jessica, would you mind just coming in for a second? Can you sit? I'm going to play something for you. I don't tell them to tell me what they think, but that's implied. Yeah. I hit play and I just go, oh, my God, it sounds so different. I'm writing all these things down and it's done. And they go, shoot it. It's fine. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, and I might have a conversation with them later, but I'm now so impressed by how different my experience was that yeah. I just jumped back in. I want to tie into one thing that you're talking about, which is this sort of whole approach to asking for feedback, because somebody might come in and start telling you everything that they hear honestly, and you could take it to heart and think I'm doing a bad job. Yeah. And I think we all experience this uncertainty. It's not like I, I think anybody who comes in and says, I always make the right decision. And I know it's the right decision every time, especially in creative work. My principles are, Go in hungry for feedback, ask for feedback, but you are not responsible to change things to make that person happy. Mm -hmm. You are responsible to yourself to listen to their feedback and then say, okay, what are the things that they said actually resonate for me? What makes sense? And then try to experiment and play with that aspect yeah. of the feedback. And that way you can graciously and fully accept the offering yeah. of what they've told you. Maybe you want the kick drum to be too loud. Maybe you want the vocals to be really quiet. Maybe, yeah. maybe. So it, it just sort of helps you navigate some ideas that maybe you wouldn't have come up with on your own. Yeah. Ask yourself, what type of feedback do you want? Mm -hmm. Do you want feedback from just a an emotional standpoint? Do you want it from a very technical standpoint? So just to give a little bit of, of a filter mm -hmm. to the people giving you feedback to go, hey, this is a very, and you name the band that you want to be competitive with. Mm. And you say, I really could use some feedback on just the vocals against the band. And that just seems to be a little more helpful than just throw somebody there to just give you, and they might tell you, oh, I hate those lyrics. I'm like, that's not really useful to me. How loud do you listen? I like to start excited. If I have a hundred points of energy to allocate to this endeavor, at the top, I'm I'm full of energy. So I like to start modestly loud. How do you know what modestly loud is? Ah, good. I think modestly loud, to me, subjectively, is dictated by the genre. Uh huh. What does modestly loud sound for a person who loves folk music versus a person who loves metal? Mm. But it's and this is very subjective. Yeah. The only thing is that the modestly and loud part needs to happen because of one, more exciting, two, the low end as well. The low end changes, yeah. whether it's folk music or not. Once I've bought into the experience, then I bring things back down. And I'm thinking of stamina. You know, this is a marathon. This is not a quick sprint. So I know that if I listen loud or modestly loud, I'm going to get burned out quicker but I need to listen with a bit of definition. So I spend a good portion of my initial listening, again, modest. Before I move on, let's say I'm working on drums and I have my kick drum and I put in my snare and I put in my overhead. So now I have the lowest of lows, the highest of highs on the overheads and the snare kind of in the middle. Great, I bring it down super quiet. Why? Because of equal loudness curves. Uh -huh. So we know equal loudness curves tell us that our perception of the different frequencies in the spectrum, we perceive them differently depending on that playback volume. Our ears are really efficient at the vocal range, right? Yep. For survival. Yo, bear, trying to eat your kid back in the day. A right? mid-range bear. <laughs> yeah. yes. So you needed to hear somebody yell out, go save the kid from the bear. 
but our ears are not as efficient and awesome yeah. in the lowest of lows and the highest of highs. But they have this interesting characteristic where the louder we listen, you know all this stuff, but you know, for everybody to refresh, the louder you listen, that mid-range and those lows and highs, they start, we start perceiving them to be more equal. So if I'm listening really, really loud, that 808, which might only have information at, let's say, hypothetically, 40 hertz, it's just punching a hole through your chest. Yeah. But if you bring it really quiet, yeah. you won't hear it anymore. Yeah. So for me, I check really quiet yeah. <laughs> because if I want my kick drum to punch through and it's not, that informs me that I might need to complement yeah. the sound of the kick drum with something that's a little bit more in the mid-range, the beater, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy to understand why you might want to change perspectives to get that that sense of balance that you get when something's quiet and what happens when the low end goes away versus turning it up and getting a truer sense of frequency dispersion. The more you change perspective, the more confused you're going to get. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, from my perspective, mm -hmm. there's something to be said for that sort of having that modestly loud as the sort of place where you start and try to stay for the most part. Yeah. So you have a baseline reference for sound in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, be very intentional about changing things. But if you spend a lot of time listening loudly and then you spend a lot of time listening quietly, you, you might confuse yourself and you might start chasing your own tail. Totally. Um, the other thing that... that um, you reminded me of when you talked about listening quietly just to get a sense of balance is ambient noise in your environment can be an issue. Having a noisy listening environment can cause you, if nothing else, if it's really noisy, can cause your work to get brighter. You tend to want to push top in to fight through the ambient noise. There's not always stuff that you can do about it, but the extent to which you can kind of create some quiet, turn off that extra laptop whose fan is running or, you know, whatever you can do. Yeah. I think it's meaningful um, to have quiet. I would start at a modestly loud level, stay there. And then it always would kind of come back to, to bite and haunt me that when I listen quiet, the mix was not as exciting. Mm -hmm. This is when I was starting out. So um, there is something about that psychological feeling of your chest is going like this that feeds into your evaluation of what's good and when it's done. Yeah. The thing is that you need to be as excited when it's this quiet. It needs to feel as exciting. And this then informs how I approach my compression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how I shape the mid-range, mm -hmm. how I emphasize things that if I'm in the sweet spot listening perfectly, I can hear them, but maybe when there's a supermarket bag crunched up against the speaker in your car, it still needs to sound exciting through that. So for me, the quiet is, I started telling myself, if it sounds exciting loud and it doesn't sound exciting quiet, you still got work to do.